So good afternoon. Thank you very much for honoring us with your presence at this talk today. I'm Isha Ray at the Energy and Resources Group and also an affiliate faculty here with the Institute. It's my great pleasure and my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor N.C. Narayanan, who's going to speak with us today. Professor Narayanan is a professor at RIT Bombay. And even though it may appear to you that that is a hotbed of engineering and technical geeks, they do have a few troublemakers and interlopers, of whom NC is one of them. Modestly radical in polite company, immodestly radical and impolite company. So I think we are looking forward to an extremely interesting talk on technology choice and governance shifts in urban water and sanitation services in India. NC and I have already worked a little bit together on a small OSI grant that we have, and I would also like to introduce today briefly the other members of the OSI grant team who are all visiting from IIT Bombay. We have Gautam in the back, we have Paresh, we have Professor Bakul Rao, and we have Poonam. So at the reception afterwards, if you would just like to speak with them more about their work on urban governance, on infrastructure, from a sort of a socio-engineering perspective, please do talk with them. Mm -hmm. And of course, here is NC himself to introduce to us the socio-engineering framework that they use. And he's going to speak with us about his work on shifts in policy on urban governance with respect to water and sanitation. And some of this work is going to be based on his most recent book, which was on urban governance and water in India. So he's one of the rare social scientists who works and engages very much with resources and resource politics while still staying on the ground where he knows a water pipe from an oil pipe, which is not something I can say about all my fellow social scientists. <laughs> with that, I would like to welcome NC to the podium. Yeah, thank you, Isha, and thank you for being so generous and also being an ally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and thank you also, Institute of South Asia Studies, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, first I thought of actually talking about the policy process, you know, the, the large policy process that's happening in urban sanitation. Um, then I thought, you know, I should actually uh, talk about a very important thing that is the governance shifts that's happening. But earlier there was only one part of my, you know, original idea. Now I thought, you know, I, I should just kind of concentrate on what's happening in the governance shifts because I, I think that's the most important part uh, that I see as this. You know, it's basically the the technology choices, how it's being made in the governance realm, and what are its implications. You know? so, and it's part of this uh, kind of a larger studies that uh, we are doing, as Isha told, I'll come to that later. So the, uh, you know, most of the people who have come to India and other parts of the, you know, kind of non-industrial world, know that, you know, um, most of the urban water bodies are polluted. You know, the, it, maybe it's rivers, it's streams, it's lakes, and we were wondering, you know, why, why it, should it be so all the time? And if there is, you know, what is the kind of way out? You know, since I, I, I came to wastewater management only, I think, in uh, 10 years back, you know, when I had a Sri Lankan project and, you know, we actually came to that. Before that, I was working on water supply. And we were working with this big concept of IWRM, you know, uh, Integrated Water Resource Management, where we were always thinking about you know, demand management, you know, and then we think that, you know, all the supplies, you know, 70% of the water that we use becomes wastewater. And so if you actually kind of, you know, treat this water something, you don't have to produce, you know, another 70%. So I think that's the kind of entry point, you know. Should all the water, you know, all the water bodies be polluted, um, you know, in, and then these questions are there, you know. So, um, what is the kind of dominant technical or policy solution that's now available, you know, um, especially in India? Um, we see that there is a, you know, there is one major centralized imagination of treatment, 
which actually has governance implications and on the and uh, because you know when when you have the centralized imagination you need a lot of resources to come in you know a lot of finances to come in which will then kind of affect you know governance in a large way and i am mostly interested in what is happening to the public water utilities which is actually the kind of you know which is supposed to manage you know all this and because that's that's the that's the core <coughs> governance question that i will be asking in this and then how to bring in more accountability to this governance which is a large question so um, i'll start with this problem of urban water pollution and the dominant solution then the financial constraints to this which actually kind of triggers reforms in governance um, which i will kind of try to illustrate through uh, two case studies uh, you know one was in sri lanka that was my learning you know kind of uh, uh, beginning of my learning there and um, at the end i'll be thinking about you know are there alternatives if this problem is there are there alternatives and this is the kind of you know the the uh, the current projects that we are uh, doing now as isha mentioned we, uh, we had this you know um, governance um, water governance in south asia in, in which this this uh, two case studies are there this um, candy case we actually began with a phd project which uh, began in 2007 when we were in candy sri lanka in pedena university uh, there was this proposal for a sewer treatment plant um, you know which was to be financed by jica and when we were finishing it it was still not over the proposal but i i'll come to that story later uh, which was kind of very revealing about you know foreign funding governance you know public water utilities you know all this then we were we did this case study in kerala also in trivandrum it's very comparable to sri lanka which you know kind of half an hour journey by flight and very comparable you know social indicators and you know all this Uh, we could also do this uh, be part of this ganga basin study where seven iits come came together and we tried to uh, uh, make it ganga basin river basin management plan where we let the kind of policy group and which also you know kind of five reports have come out of that and then there are two uh, ongoing uh, projects you know neelam's projects is on uh, psd is on uh, pro- policy process in sanitation and gautam who is here this uh, his is on uh, policy process in drinking water supply which are kind of closely related and then we have these two ongoing projects uh, one is with uh, lakli so coming to the conceptual frame every, many of you know this you know this is a slightly exaggerated figure where we have the pre reform state where the for the, for india it is the nehruvian state which was the kind of designer provider of you know development and then you shift here um, you have you know the uh, neoliberalism tells that the state actually diminishes but does it is the question we can ask later uh, but uh, definitely what happens is um, you know some kind of a um, hollowing out of the state where you know uh, the state actually gives to supra national bodies like european union and then to kind of you know sub national bodies like you know states or panchayats in india and then there is a lateral shift towards you know kind of civil society and uh, and market but you know that's the kind of general understanding this that we have but we want to nuance this this into the state into in india into central government state government and then this urban local bodies for for the the, the issue that we are talking about and then there is this new entity called the special purpose vehicles which come with you know big foreign funding that's that now available i think you know the whole issues are now so here is where the the kind of all decisions are being taken and outside the you have the public water utility in water governance so so i think you know so this is particularly the kind of worry that we are going to talk about regarding governance Uh, reforms you know it actually started long time back in 92 8 five year plan uh, that's where in water they introduced this concept of water as a commodity effective demand cost recovery principle management by local private organizations and national water policy came in 
it suggested this policy and you know kind of regulatory framework to take these ideas forward. Uh, so now we are going to talk about you know urban water and sanitation. Uh, what is the problem? You know the the dominant kind of uh, you know posing the problem is that we have sanitation coverage only for 33 percent. That is you know that, that is the connected sewerage coverage is for only for 33 percent according to this census 2011. Urban population is 600 million, increasing migration to cities. So, you know, cities are going to get, you know, really, this is a problem. And then another problem that's being told is the capacity deficit. You know, we have only one third capacity to kind of treat this. And even with that capacity, these civil treatment plants are not working back. So that's the, that's the problem that's being kind of posed. And the solution is again the sewage treatment plants, which are centralized technical imagination, high on demanding of investments, land, energy management, and it's also an end of the pipe solution where you have to bring all the pollution to one point and then get it treated. Uh, so if you look at the history of this, let us say big sanitation divide, where you know the the beginning of the thinking was actually uh, when the British thought about, you know, the uh, the kind of, you know, concern of the health of the British officers and, you know, most of the cities are now divided into a core where, you know, we have the kind of septic tanks and sewage systems and then there is an ocean of, you know, other parts uh, around around the city. So this, this, and this core and periphery actually kind of, you know, um, uh, was very much kind of acceptable at that time. But then came the Nehruvian legacy, where especially with the 1952 kind of plague um, um, uh, and uh, in uh, uh, no, cholera in uh, Delhi, uh, public health engineering department was supposed to be formed in every state. So then state actually took the kind of you know responsibility of this uh, sanitation, and state was the provider and supposed to be the provider, but in reality the divide continued and uh, so we have three types of you know initiatives now one is this more you know most marginal areas which we call as slums which have actually public toilets and uh, which are um, done by the slum development boards and there is a huge thrust on that with this new uh, government's idea of the swedge fire in 2014 uh, there are 25 lakh toilets actually, 2.5 million toilets actually kind of built in the last uh, two years, which is all going to be the kind of next problem of pollution. Then there are the small cities and towns which have only septic tanks and drains, and because the argument is that they have low per capita water supply, mm -hmm. low per capita wa wastewater generation, so they, it's not economical to kind of build a kind of plant. Then we have big cities where there is supposed to be a complete sewerage network system, but which is not there. And then we have this flag, flagship programs like Ganga cleaning, Yamuna cleaning, which is also kind of, which wants to kind of, you know, go in this big city direction. So even in the Ganga basin, it's only the big cities that gets this uh, kind of priority. Uh, but there is a lot of studies which says that you know centralized approach is costly and you know kind of exclusive, where seventy percent of the cost actually goes to the sewerage network, and then there is very little money left for that, um, uh, for running it. Um, so what I want to kind of highlight here is the kind of you know the the major shift that happened uh, from level plan period is the is. Uh, when this urban water and sanitation sector was transformed in infrastructure sector from a social service. And this was actually cities as engines of growth and then it attracted a lot of investments into into the sector where, um, I'm sorry, I have put in crores and now uh, it's, I, I think I, have, I had a quick calculation actually, central assistance Increase from 37 billion Indian rupees to a kind of 430 billion Indian rupees in the in a span of six years. So that's a huge increase, you know, which happened in this uh, sector. And but there are more heroic kind of you know calculations done. Like this is done by um, 
Professor Isha Jajjahil Waliya, I don't know how many of you know that, I haven't heard. And um, uh, uh, this is like, you know, she calculated that you need something like, um, I don't know how many zeros, 31 lakh crore, um, which works out to be actually 13, uh, 329 rupees capital cost and 840 rupees capital, uh, you know, operation cost per capita. So it's a huge investment. That's, that's being kind of demanded. And uh, then we, when we looked at the Ganga Basin uh, calculations, it comes around something like 33 million Indian rupees per you know, million liters of uh, per MLD um, uh, capital cost is that. So when we calculate it, this actually runs to, again, 50, you know, uh, something like uh, 57 million uh, Indian rupees for one base in Europe. So the point is that, you know, the centralized solution is a kind of hugely capital intensive science fiction which a, 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 a kind of, you know, a country like India, I don't know, can afford at any point of time. Then ca came the understanding that, ha, huh, now we need public-private investments, state companies. So what we need is private investments. World Bank study, not any radical studies which says that, you know, this is the kind of, you know, um, cost of equity that is return on investments in, um, you know, uh, across sectors. We say that, you know, energy is very lucrative, ports are very lucrative, water is not. So, uh, no private investments came. And it is mostly uh, kind of public money uh, being spent with private management or, you know, kind of <coughs> that, that was the, uh, that is what is being planned. Um, when we look at the private sector's, you know, perspective, it is the uh, opportunity cost of investing in a non-lucrative sector. So, uh, they will not come. Second is the 70% of the costs are for actually, you know, to bring in the backward linkages of bringing in the sewage, which is actually very costly and, you know, so they are not interested in that. Then there are these complications of arriving at annuity, transaction costs of dealing with local politicians, so, you know, private sector is not interested. Citizens also have concerns because, you know, uh, no, this is, uh, uh, urban local bodies have a problem. Uh, allocating land, you know, mm -hmm. is, is, is ma a major problem in most of the cities. And most importantly, there are capacity gaps in assessing, you know, the flows, the tariffs, you know, annuity, and the whole regulation, which they are not kind of you know, in no way they can do that. And citizens are also concerned because these are publicly funded projects, so government subsidies or enhanced tariff, so anyway the people have to pay. It's, it, it's public money has to come in. Limited market for wastewater in the absence of groundwater regulation, which is impossible in India. I don't know where, anywhere it's kind of happening. Um, so, and then we have seen many PPPs, you know, the kind of uh, the nexus between the, the, the regulator, the state, and the kind of capital, where we see that, you know, there are gold-plated investments that are coming in, you know, like highly over invoice capital costs. Um, so all these political economy concerns are there for the citizens also. So PPP also kind of did not kind of, you know, uh, come in, especially in a sector like sanitation and also water supply. In ports, in you know, kind of power plants, it's it's, it's already uh, in a, in a, in there in a big way. So our lessons from this is that you know the there's a centralized imagination leads to high capital and operation costs. Investment needed for infrastructure building for cities as engines of growth. PPPs uh, did not bring in investments. Then um, huge allocations through foreign funding and flagship products of the union government, which also kind of, you know, silently kind of, you know, funded by World Bank also. So, um, in this scenario, what are the governance implications? You know, when a big influx of money comes in, what happens? So, I have two case studies. Um, one is from Sri Lanka, where, you know, Candy, um, a small city, um, yeah, there was this uh, suggestion for a three billion uh, Sri Lankan rupee SDP in 1998 and 83% of this was supposed to come from JICA. 
they chose the kind of highest, um, you know, high, highest cost uh, solution of advanced treatment because that's that's how loans work. And then um, I won't go into the details. Only benefits to lenders and you know cost to borrowers. That's what I'm going to tell. So from the foreign portion of the board loan, construction contracts, engineering services, almost 50 percent goes back to lenders. Then. Um, selling the black box of technology because there's no capacity building happening there. Then 40% of the operation costs um, are for chemicals, repair and maintenance. 90% go back to the donors. And then there is an inflated cost cost of poor price expertise. You know, yeah. Okay. Our questions allowed in the yeah. So 90% going back to the donors annually, like uh, it's you know it's basically you know everything has to come to, come from there. <coughs> the chemicals the expertise, the country asset. yeah, it, that's the package. Okay. That's the package for this kind of a technology. You have to kind of get the inputs also from there, uh -huh. including the. So this is all kind of you know long-term contracts. And I have calculations of you know how much is the kind of annual. It's like eleven million. Uh, it's there. You know, estimated cost is actually. So the burden to borrowers is basically you know, the seventy percent cost is laying this US, which is actually with the Sweden government. And unless you do that. This won't flow, but the plant is already there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these are unplanned cities, so it's very difficult for you know these to come overnight. And uh, there are a lot of problems also. Then 40 percent is low income settlements that doesn't come in into their purview at all. So estimate on income cost is 10 percent of the capital cost, which is 11 million per month, and we. And you know, minus capital cost, even the OM cost to get it back, you should have a sheet tax of four ten rupees per month per household. It's mm -hmm. even water supply they don't give that, you know. So how can you kind of imagine this to be done? So institutional weakening, overpriced foreign consultancy, lack of institutionalization, which will be which we'll see in the Kerala case also. Uh, continuous import of materials, dependence, and the most important part is you have a end of the pipe solution where you concentrate all the waste to a point and if there's a power failure there's a 700 percent increase into flow into the Mahaveli river which was supposed to get cleaned mm -hmm. by this and and power cuts are kind of you know quite frequent in, in, in that part of the world so this may increase pollution so this is one and then um, we have another um, case study of Trivandrum is actually very, you know, I think um, 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 geopolitically, socially, very comparable, you know, kind of uh, Kerala, where we see that, you know, there is from 1931, we have a, we have a system there, and there is, uh, you know, 1947, uh, it became public health engineering wing of the pu uh, public works department, later it was converted into a parasitic body called Kerala Water Authority. So when I say KWA later into this, it's Kerala Water Authority. You know, 1938, they had a sewage farm. It is much less in scale, but very comparable to the East Calcutta wetlands. And I think that's the most efficient kind of, one of the most efficient kinds of, you know, uh, treatment systems where, uh, I was reading somewhere, it's cradle to cradle you know, one waste to another raw material and then, you know, and there's a lot of livelihoods happening there, like fisheries and uh, in, in Calcutta and farming. Here also, you know, the folder was being cultivated and, you know, almost the whole Chivandam city's folder demands were kind of met from the storage farm. But then preventive maintenance was not done, capacity kind of surpassed, so you needed an STP. And then came the Asian Development Bank loan in 2009, Scientists received significant attention. We came with a special purpose vehicle called KSUDP, that's Kerala State Urban Development Project, which part of this gain and new RM money also, and Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission, which was also the kind of flagship program which brought in a lot of money. So when you get all this money, you need to kind of ring fence this, this uh, funding. So that's why you have this SPV. And then you don't you don't kind of work with the public water utility like Kerala Water Authority or the urban local body, which are the kind of you know traditional governance mechanisms. I won't go into the details. I just want to highlight you know 
when um, you know a load of uh, this this amount comes in, then I think you know thirty percent is actually put in by the government. Here also Jayden or also etc. So if so a loan coming in with all those you remember Sri Lanka's you know yeah, it's it's all all inflated you know. Uh, I, I'll, I'll come to this, you know, almost 30 percent actually goes back in the se first year to Japan as consultancy. So, and already the state has to spend this much money. So can we think about a solution where if we have this money being invested, you know, is, is, is the larger question that we have to ask. So governance has become very kind of complicated, where Government of India gives money to Government of Kerala through the Indian Union program. It comes to municipal corporation, that's MC. And then ADB also, it's the same. And both of this, this PMU, PSU is the kind of, you know, foreign consultancy companies, which uh, which makes a PIU, that is a foreign implementing unit also. So these are all foreign consultancy companies, which has to kind of do this, uh, you know, planning and implementation of this. And then there is something called this design services as well. These are all, Retired Kerala Water Authority engineers who actually did everything. So I think that is where the problem is. You know, if we are bringing fantastic experience, expertise from from these countries, then it's okay because they don't have a crew. They don't even have, and these people have maps and you know everything, and they have kind of you know they get an access to these uh, things also, and they know they have done it for 30, 40 years. So only those people can actually do it. So, and then current water authority is completely out. So there's a fragmented governance where, you know, um, there is this urban local body, water authority, and uh, SPV. And municipal corporation owns, operates infrastructure, sets revision of talents, but completely no capacity. So they have to uh, rely on KW as a provider who doesn't have any power or responsibility with them. And then the SPV coordinates the design and implementation and also a turnkey uh, operation maintenance provider for the five years. So expertise is only there, which is actually retired engineers and very young engineers who are consultants. So this whole knowledge or, you know, is not kind of institutionalized anywhere. So with SPV evaporates after five years and then we don't know what will happen. Uh, transparency in governance, you know, KSUDP maintained quarterly annual reports, but not disseminated. We found 50% hike in revisions, you know, and an average in all, all, all the projects, the costs. And this is basically driven by something called the minimum commitment in loan utilization. Because when you have a loan agreement for five years, in the first year you should kind of spend this much money. If you don't, you have a fine. So then what you do is, you know, you actually kind of inflate the cost of all all this, you know. So so that's the minimum thing. And then um, very little information available in the public realm. So one example is this, you know, the, the, su the Suez treatment plant, where uh, they, in March 2008, they had a detailed project report prepared for 320 million rupees. In December, when the tender was notified, it was 545. When it was awarded, it became 726. And this we kind of got by, by kind of detective work and not by any kind of public information. So it's very difficult to kind of get this kind of information also, and right? very opaque kind of uh, projects also. So um, and this 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 happens because of this commitment, you know, this this commitment for spending. Um, yeah. So there is a hundred and seven <coughs> million liters per day STP, but we have a sewerage capacity only for 30 percent. So then why did you kind of make this 170 best? That could have been easily done, you know, uh, stage-wise when this is. And construction of new sewers is slow, mm -hmm. land acquisition problems, you know, like every kilometer you need uh, 20 cents of land, it's one-fifth of an acre. It's actually not very small in, in, in cities. Um, which then kind of, you know, then there are public protests, NIMBY. Uh, in, in this JNNURM program, there's no allocation made for, you know, compensation to acquire land. So
so impressive DPRs are prepared, but it's not kind of, you know, not operational. Um, we found that, you know, consultancy amounts, um, it, in the first year it was 84 percent, where, you know, the foreign consultants actually got most of it in the first year itself, and average it was 18 to 20 percent was the kind of, you know, the consultancy that was being spent. Uh, so, uh, coming to the analysis, I think there is a mismatch between this, what we call as the global expertise and the global imagination and the local context. So, Kerala Water Authority is in a financial crisis. They don't plan with foresight with the growing organization, which invites soft loans. And then these loans come with opaque terms and, you know, kind of global standards of infrastructure planning. In, invites international consultancy expertise, which leads to de-skilling of you know the public water utility, water utility engineers, and we found that you know it's mostly done by the retired water authority person with international consultancy counting bulk of uh, this allocation. So uh, context has challenges to accommodate global models. So can we fit in models or conceive models that suit the context? That's the question that we are asking. Actually, I think this is where our project actually begins, you know, where, um, yeah, how in that do, do we kind of, you know, understand this, you know, is the, is the question. So, um, it's not even methodology, I think, what's the epistemology of, you know, kind of, you know, grappling with this issue is the question that we ask. So, the second, um, so, uh, some of the very large suggestions that came where, you know, how to monitor the KWA internally developing ownership by staff service unions. You know, you, many of you may know PSI's work, you know, Public Service International Research Unit Greenwich, you know, in University of Greenwich, which actually kind of tells about, you know, how to kind of assess privatization, how to have, you know, kind of systems where, you know, the, the, the labor unions and, you know, um, and the kind of larger population gets involved in this and, you know, so whatever, even if privatization happens, can we know how much are we going to spend? And you know, so is there a transparency in this whole exercise is one question. Um, second, you know, is one thing that we are trying to kind of think about in IIT. IIT, there's a study where 70 percent of the students actually go to finance and consultancy. After studying four years of engineering with public money, so, um, and this, this happens throughout the kind of, you know, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, in the kind of lower tiers of engineering colleges also, where they go to IT and, you know. So, uh, there's absolutely no domain knowledge actually kind of being used or, uh, the, so can we integrate these practical challenges that, that we saw in cities and, and villages into the kind of curriculum of engineering and, you know, other education also is, is one second question that, you know, we are asking. This will make uh, a lot of analytical inputs into these urban local bodies and panchayats, as well as um, it gives some kind of a grounding to the kind of knowledge that's being kind of provided also. Which needs then uh, curriculum change uh, from the academic side. Um, um, so, uh, to develop a new breed of engineers who can do the art of engineering. You know, so, which actually kind of, you know, to kind of understand these nuances so you know they they actually study the art of engineering after they go to iit then they go to iim indian institute of management and by the time you know they uh, you know the 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 price will be kind of affordable only to pwg and you know this big consultancy groups then they will come through jica and advisors you know so so the point is, and then or they will come to Silicon Valley. You know? So can we have, you know, other types of, uh, you know, the different types of knowledges that are more contextual, sectoral. In energy, we need this. In water, we need this. You know, and and uh, these are all not kind of, you know, the the uh, beyond this textual knowledge. You know, can we have or also a practice? One example is, you know, in the in 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 this uh, medical education. Everybody has to do one year of rural education, rural mm. practice. And engineers doesn't have any kind of responsibility like that. So can we have 
three months or six months of you know kind of compulsory you know such type so which can then actually you know uh, bring a lot of so there are two things one we develop contextual knowledge that can be usable second we bring in a lot of there's a civil society role also you know so um, Professor Burabe's uh, understanding of university as civil society you know? so I think that's that, that's the kind of publicness that we kind of you know uh, need also here. Um, quickly to alternatives, um, you know, uh, can we have decentralized sewage, sewage management? This one question that we are asking. Less capital intensive technology as water stated resource, better septic tanks. I was so kind of fascinated looking at uh, US EPA website where September 8, 17 to 23rd was septic smart week. And I think, you know, some uh, uh, some states have even 50 percent this, you know, safety tanks, you know, uh, which are kind of efficiently done in the U.S. <coughs> and you know, um, then helps escape laying sewer lines. You know, uh, that that is one of my major agenda in coming to Berkeley. My proposal in Fulbright was this: um, G Germany is actually going in a very decentralized manner. GI is a GT is a, you know, they are the kind of biggest proponents of the decentralized initiatives. They are a big policy player in India also. Japan is doing a major way. They are going back into decentralized systems. And US also, I, I, I saw that. So I, I said, you know, so we already, we have an opportunity to leapfrog to sustainability. We don't have to go through the all the stupidities of industrial modernity and then come back to sustainability. Because already coverage is very less. You know. <laughs> like, you know, only 13% is covered. So why should we cover all 100 and then come back to more sustainable ways of doing it? So, so I think you know that's one big, the kind of bigger philosophical question that uh, we have to ask. And you know, it's not only in this; you know, in many, many other things. When sustainability becomes the lens, I think it's a very interesting, you know, kind of contextual things have to be, um, you know, looked for. So this helps escape laying sewer lines with 70 percent. We have successful models in two, three cities, um, which actually gives opportunity for self-provisioning of affluent groups and institutions. Why should we kind of, you know, publicly fund these uh, big apartments and you know big hospitals and you know why should we connect them? So they should have, if they have their own, then a lot of public money is saved, which can be then used to <coughs> do it in marginal areas. So alternative approach is basically four principles. Decentralization, transparency, accountability, and participation, big words, but we're trying to kind of, you know, get it through these projects, you know, can we, we're grappling with, you know, how to do this also. Uh, planning for treatment at appropriate stages, you know, at the household level, at apartment complexes, community level, and if there is something left, we can think about centralized STP. We are not against that, but then there should be dense settlements or, you know, uh, maybe more marginal settlements need centralized treatment and, you know, the rich can actually afford to have self-provisioning, you know, something like that. Then implementation, um, can we have a proper way of assessing the wastewater generation, designing on the scales of treatment at these scales, and then arriving at appropriate technology choices and institutional options? How can you bring in transparency, accountability, and participation? You know, it's actually behavioral changes and... Um, um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Are there important economies of scale? I, I, I can see the advantage of decentralization for accountability and supervision. But how much do you lose in terms of cost, mm -hmm. co cost per unit of treatment? You know, well, our calculations show that, you know, uh, cost-wise there's no much saving, capital <coughs> cost-wise. But the whole saving comes in the operation cost. It's actually, you know, these national systems and dollar kind of, you know, uh, the maintenance costs are very less, and but, but the problem is, you know, you should have more involvement, more community involvement. You cannot kind of, you know, forget it. You need kind of much more of, you know. But the other one is not working. That's the problem. The centralized system is an is an imagination only. But there is the issue of whether it's not working because of management, supervision, accountability, and there is the issue of what is the cost effectiveness of centralized versus decentralized. If you can convince us that there are no big economies of scale, then your solution seems to be very No, no, I, I, I may not be able to convince on that point. Be because, you know, I it's like uh, uh, productivity. When we say about agriculture, you know, 
gene technologies are needed because you need productivity. But then you, when you ask several other questions, I think you know, including sustainability, dependence, and you know, and and then um, you have kind of a, so that's why we say about heterodox options. So where this this centralized is needed is the question that we can ask. And then you know, taxing also is a major issue. You know, the if it's an ideal, you know, kind of. Um, socialist situation, you know, or, you know, where the state kind of can kind of finance this whole whole thing, agree. But that's not happening now. You know, now there's a political economy of allocations actually going into big cities and within that into big, uh, you know, in, into kind of very elite settlements. So, and this should become a discussion because, you know, we need heterodox options because, you know, there should be different ways of kind of treating it. So I think, the, um, um, so the point is, you know, can we then generate a variety of generic technologies, protocols to develop at various levels and scales, capacity building of state institutions, local academic institutions as consultants, and then curriculum change, you know, including project work and all. You know, so these are the kind of very, so our ongoing studies are this, and I have only one more slide. Um, you know, first three, are actually, you know, kind of uh, one PhD is finishing with, with these uh, um, three studies that we are coming out of that. You know, one is this diverse of change in policy process, where we see that, you know, this WSP, uh, that is this uh, water and sanitation program of World Bank, they are the kind of driver of this uh, decentralized options also. And it's, it's very interesting. And, uh, uh, and they are the ones who actually kind of you know fund the kind of the other projects also. So I think as a smart bank, it's diversifying into all these other things. And so it's not essentially that, but we have to ask this question whether you know how much of that is kind of feasible. So that's the major thing. And then national urban sanitation policy is a very heterogeneous policy. But when you come to the you know. Um, from policy to, to to financial allocations and implementation of schemes, it is a, again a very kind of centralized. So I think that's the mismatch that we have. Uh, then we have uh, analyzed this techno-financial analysis of this DWOT systems in 18 case studies, which then tells this, you know, there's no much, not much advantage in capital cost, but definitely in the long term in ONM there, there is. Then uh, scaling up alternatives, uh, in sanity and then Bangalore is a city which actually kind of is trying it. So we have done that case study of how this um, and where it is kind of happening. It's not all good, but there is something happening there. Um, then you know this changing role of state water utility. This is what Gautam is doing. Is most mostly kind of anthropology of the state of the public water utility. The historical evolution of these three stages, you know, where there's a very state-run stage, and then there is this, you know, kind of more liberalized stage, and then there is, you know, the the the, the present one where they're completely kind of out of it. And, um, and the situational analysis of participatory sanitation planning in small cities is what we started in our project, which we in Alibaba. And we are following it up with a curriculum study in environmental engineering. What are the perspectives, trusts, and solutions? Then we are looking at the Canadian and other international funding in sanitation. Again, what are the trust areas, influence, and, and then the future is in people search management, which I think you know, Parish may be taking. Care. So this is my concluding slide. So what I try to kind of tell us how a global uh, policy discourse is emerging, which uh, working through these international financial institutions, and uh, there are vision documents, which actually affects the government of India, you know, policies, and um, which then these international financial institutions are funding conditionalities also, they can bring in to state public water utilities and urban local bodies. And, uh, and gram panchayats, local politicians. So I think this is the level at which you know things have to work now because we have this constitutional amendment for decentralization. So this is where things have to happen. Uh, and then you have the expert knowledge providers who can directly come here. You know they kind of bypass state 
utility and come here. And here, absolutely no capacity. There's only, you know, kind of half an engineer here. That's the only thing that's here. So that's where the kind of whole, the, 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 the consultancy, SPV, kind of an entry is happening at this stage. So the major question that we are asking is, you know, can, can we help them in planning, assessment, technology selection, institutional options, implementation, monitoring, and regulation? So can civil society organizations, NGOs, academic institutions and knowledge providers, you know, kind of do this. And it all depends on how the local action shaping politics of water will emerge in the future. So I think um, one small role that we uh, in the academia can play is to kind of, I think, bring in more grounded knowledge and bring in more kind of, you know, um, um, some more kind of a proactive role in, in kind of shaping this this context and knowledge provision. Thank you. Yeah. So one question I had was, you opened up in your critique of the centralized systems with a very strong critique of the sort of financial mechanisms through which these were funded. And then when you went to the decentralized solutions, you kind of stuck with the technologies. But isn't it the case that if financial mechanisms are driving choice of technology, then you have to seriously consider what kind of financial mechanisms would enable at scale decentralized technologies also, because you know, yeah. either financing is a driver or it's not a driver. It's not yes. going to be just a driver for the big guys. It's also going to be a driver. Okay. So that, that seems to be something I, I, I didn't You know, what we're trying here. to do is now um, in, in Kerala, we are trying to be much more proactive now. We have done one situational analysis, and then we are following it with six now, because a local NGO has, you know, is very interested in that. And then we are simultaneously working with the <coughs> Secretary to Government also, and the ULB body, you mm -hmm. know, the urban local bodies, you know. So we have to kind of convince them, you know. So it has to come as a demand from, from state levels, from urban local body levels. Mm -hmm. Then only will this change will happen. Like for example, Alibab has uh, something like you know um, um, uh, six six crore rupees for the centralized uh, unit, but it's not happening because it's a high water table area, and that's kind of stuck. They can't do anything with that. Mm -hmm. So I think I if we can have so uh, simultaneously, we are developing a network also. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you know, we had a workshop on twenty seven. Where Center for Science and Environment is at, you know, many of these uh, DWARDs and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all these, you know, kind of like minded people are coming together. And um, so, over a period of one or two years, I think, you know, we have to mm -hmm. kind of mainstream this idea of decentralization. But for that, I think the, our work is very important. What is step one? What is step two? What is step three? So, the protocol is needed. Um, otherwise, as an idea, it won't work. And we have to demonstrate it also. We are kind of trying to make a film also, you know, how to do these trainings and... But there are many people who are doing it also. SEPT, I think, is in a, in a major way doing it. CSE is a loud voice, you know. Do you want to moderate the Q&A? So, are there any... Oh, yeah, in the back. So, uh, the question is, uh, basically, do you see this, uh, this crisis to be more pronounced in any part of uh, India, or is it... Do you see very uniform, uh, any specific geography you want to talk uh, about? You know, uh, since I work a lot in Kerala, um, yeah. there is a study by this, uh, there's a World Bank project on rural water supply. They found that 70% of wells in Kerala have pathogens. So, it, because, you know, it's, it's a very dense settlement, and then every house, and it's a kind of 98% coverage of toilets. So every house has a toilet and a well. So I think, that the, and, and, and it's a highly urbanizing uh, kind of a state also, where uh, there are something like 300 villages which have become census towns. It's not towns, but you know, certain areas are becoming urbanized. So I think that those are the kind of real, you know, um, uh, I, I would say hotspots. And then every city has this of different, that's part of the problem. You have toilets, 
we have education, we have SDI, and then you know nobody. This is last in the priority of individuals as well as policy. Sanitation. You know. Now sanitation means you know providing toilets, but what after that is the, is, the, is the major question. So Kerala could be one question mark to the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, which is actually building toilets. So, go ahead, Sean. So that's a bit of a segue to my question, actually. When we, I mean, we understand the cost, the operations and maintenance cost of a centralized system, but when we think about household systems, what I've seen mostly is operation maintenance cost is just ignored. Yeah. But if we really thought about the monitoring, you know, and then placing the training on all of these homeowners or the monitoring that would actually be required to see if the septic or the toilet is still maintained and not flooding the drinking water supply, there would be a cost. Yeah. And I'm wondering if in your analysis <coughs> if you're assigning a cost and, and how that's done. I've not thought about it. I think you know that's one of the future thing. You know, one thing that we did is a is a student who came three months from Canada. She did a very kind of gross calculation between these two. And then she was for centralized. But the point is, you know, her mindset also was that, you know. She was an economist who came into this and, you know, it was kind of economic cost that she was kind of uh, looking at. And I think we should have uh, better ways of kind of doing it also. So um, what I will say is that, you know, in the long run, what do you need is the question. In the long run, in the, in the next 20 years or 30 years, if we want to plan it, I would like to kind of, you know, do this situation analysis and, you know, that's, that, that, that's the perspective from which I'm working. Because the world is moving that direction. Right. <laughs> but, like I said, certain costs and even health costs, things that yeah. cost that come later as a, a function of what's not done with operations and maintenance, the cost comes, but sometimes they're not accounted for. Yeah, most often they're not the yeah. but the, here it's a non-starter for me. Send based option in such cities is actually a non-starter. So we need something. So we need first, you know, some kind of a FSM to be in place. That's the first thing to do. And then well, maybe, maybe you should yeah. say what FSM is. People may not know that abbreviation. Yeah, it's vehicle exactly. site management. You know, it's actually separating this uh, kind of you know water, which is called black water, from toilets mm -hmm. and you know the the gray water is actually the other kind of you know, not so bad water so i think if that separation is done uh, in the, in the beginning i think you know that's a starting point that we can kind of go over i agree with all these questions but what i think is that you know we need to kind of approach it you know the whole approach has to change so can we yeah that's it shabri then in the back Please. Can add something? Oh yeah, sure, add something, of course, yeah. of course. So with, uh, uh, with the thrust of building toilets, so uh, amount of 12,000 is given to every household who wants to build a toilet, which comes with a septic tank. So you have septic tanks in place, and there is no proper drainage provided. So what he is saying is why not connect them first, and then look for bigger options. No, because we are putting in that much of money. So why not take that first and provide a localized solution and then look for larger... Like micro-grids. Yeah. Then it's macro grid. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I think yeah. it's yeah. an addition, but I can add Let's, let's uh, let people ask questions and we can also talk. Please, go ahead. You, you didn't tell us anything about how the state public utilities are managed in terms of finance. Yeah. Do they have a self-project constraint? Can they collect fees? I mean, the typical situation would be you have a public utility which is managed sort of with kind of private objectives, right? <coughs> so they, have, they don't have a self-project constraint. They have to meet cost, right? Yeah. And they're able to raise funds from the clients. <coughs> so, or, or here, are we in the situation where there's no fee which is being collected? It's pure public cost? Um, no, I think you know it, it comes with the kind of what we call as the 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 building tax. You know, it's it's part of that is being collected, which you know there's a lot of resistance to this kind of a fee also. So I think part of this whole exercise we have to kind of you know make the public also aware of why this is sent. You know, so 
So that's why you know this tap. I'm telling in a very practical sense. If people have the information, you know what is the cost of water? What is the cost of sanitation? I think you know that local discussion can actually emerge. Even the tax can be increased. Otherwise, for everything there is a resistance now because there is no service. You are just kind of you know raising the cost. So I think both have to kind of go together. You know, some co-evolution of these well, two things. I mean, have to if you have taxation with representation, this is the best way of mobilizing the you know, public opinion that yeah. is going to exercise supervisory capacity. Right? Yeah. So uh, as soon as people start to pay, do we want to know what is it what they are paying for? Yes. Right? Yeah. In the back, you've been waiting patiently. Um, this might just be my misunderstanding, but you kind of expressed ap apprehension about the privatization of uh, water sanitation services, while also um, saying that from the private sector's perspective, they're not interested because it's not lucrative. Um, could you kind of clarify that? Um, um, you know, um, yeah, we can talk, but you know, the best um, resources are with psiru.org. Uh, that's the Public Service International Research Unit of uh, Greenwich, University of Greenwich, who has actually studied the, you know, kind of financing of this privatization. You know? it's the, the pattern is like this, you know, the international financial institutions fund these projects. And then private entities come as, you know, uh, uh, the, the kind of um, what you call the um, operational managers. You know, they, do, they don't kind of invest anything. So what they do is, you know, they come and then, you know, they can actually kind of, you know, uh, retrench people. They can uh, enhance the kind of, you know, um, tariffs and things like that. Uh, in Delhi Jal Board, you know, the, the Delhi Water Board, um, there is a very interesting uh, things where PWG has come in. And then four officers were you know, who are foreign consultants, the kind of money that's being given to them. Uh, some Somebody has actually brought it out through, you know, this public litigation and all. Um, um, so there's high costs of those kinds of consultancy expertise, international expertise, basically friends, you know, when they, when they come in. Um, but, you know, do you want them for that kind of a cost to kind of manage this kind of a utility? And at the end of the day, we see that you know it's 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 basically the engineers there who are kind of running it, limping it through. And in Trivandrum, uh, for yeah, I, I think you you have worked on Prachimala, Kerala always boasts like you know they have thrown Coca Cola out, mm -hmm. but Trivandrum utility is now being run by the French company, mm -hmm. one of the biggest French multinational, which nobody knows, because it, it came through a big loan, and they were the kind of you know the the management contracts were given to them. Now Kerala Water Authority is very afraid to take it back because they don't know what what is in that black box. Mm -hmm. Do you so mind if I say something? In, was that your question, or were you actually saying is there a contradiction in this analysis with saying that the private sector has been invited in, and then we're seeing a graph which says, well, the private sector doesn't want to come. Is that your question, or was this your? I'm, I'm not sure that. Yeah. So I think he's trying to say that if the privatization is running apace, then how do you explain this other graph that you showed where the private sector is in fact more interested in telecommunications and ports and they're not interested in water? How can we square the two? I, that's how no, I, I think interpret returns it. To, it. Returns to investments is very low in water. Mm. It was almost zero in that graph. Whereas yeah. ports and energy, it was very lucrative. I think the, you ports and uh, ports and energy, it's it's very high returns to investment. Mm -hmm. So that's why in the whole Gujarat coast, you know, we have all thermal power plants and, you know, uh, ports. And the coal comes from Malaysia and, you know, this is all coming up and, you know, so, uh, and then this, uh, uh, what do you call it, this AZ sets also. What's it? Uh, special economic zones where, you know, yeah. So in all the privatization is happening, but water sector, very, very less, and sanitation, nobody. Yes, please. Can I ask you Coming a pretty, to the pretty naive question, maybe? You mentioned a couple of uh, examples like Calcutta Water Processing Center. I mean, is that not scalable or sustainable? No, Calcutta is basically natural treatment. It's, it's happening there. Um, uh, 
which is actually like Calcutta is a big wetland. So what they try to do is, you know, they actually kind of bring all these wastewater there, and this is being used for farming as well as fisheries. But in, since it's already there is a lot of water there, I think you know it doesn't get much of a problem, and people have been using that, you know, for uh, quite a while. But then uh, government Supreme Court came out with this ruling that you know you cannot put uh, wastewater into wetlands. Which actually, you know, happening in many other parts. Then Calcutta had to kind of stop that, and then there is a major problem for those people there because crops have kind of reduced very much. So I am not telling that you know it's all good, but the point is that you know there are ways in which we were dealing with that, and how much can we use that without you know thinking about you know in Kerala what happened was that this whole sewerage farm was closed. And a small portion is SDP now. The rest of it is all kind of, you know, garment buildings. It all became real estate land. So there's no kind of possibility now existing for, you know, kind of such options. But there are many coastal towns and cities in India. But all, all big cities are coastal. Right. So Bombay has a big, uh, exactly. you know, so why big mangrove area and, you know. It's a valley, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So. so so can research go into, can we make that more effective than, you know, kind of this kind of preoccupation with this kind of water chemistry, pollution, you know, and big structures? Oh, I was going to ask, you talked about people sludge management. Uh, is there a possibility of using this people sludge as a resource and harvesting the methane yes. from it? Yes. Because here, East Bay Mud does that, and we recently have come on that, so that's For me, it's future research. I have Sharda here, who is an expert. I think Paresh can come in. Sharda, I think you, you should be. Yeah, again, uh, just to uh, quickly answer that question. Uh, to summarize, you, you want to focus on looking at this as more of a uh, resource mm -hmm. than other ways. And of course, not mm -hmm. only methane, it, it is also a very good fertilizer. If you look at it that way. But all of that really requires focus on how this is going to be collected, transported, and treated in one centralized area. And a lot of conversation is going on in that direction these days in India. And yes, uh, but there is also another area where the perception of farmers, especially a country like India, where they wouldn't even want to cook using biogas mixed with toilet waste. Forget about something, cook using methane. So there is also those social implications that we do want to do. But we can talk about it. Other questions for Thank you very much for Thank coming you. to speak today. Thank you for being a wonderful.